Good afternoon, bon après-midi. Thank you for joining us for today's media availability on the novel coronavirus COVID-19. Merci de vous joindre à nous pour cette disponibilité média au sujet du nouveau coronavirus COVID-19. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few items. A reminder to please place your microphone on mute until I invite you to speak or to ask your question. To view who is speaking on Zoom, please put your view on speaker view instead of gallery view. The button for this is located in the top right corner of the Zoom video screen. Veuillez changer votre écran au mode speaker en anglais pour pouvoir mieux voir les porte paroles Le bouton est situé en haut à la droite de la porte de vidéo de l'écran. Reporters with accessibility needs can pin the interpreters or follow along on the YouTube stream. Les journalistes ayant des besoins en matière d'accessibilité peuvent avoir recours aux interprètes ou suivre la diffusion en direct sur YouTube. Today we'll be hearing remarks from Dr. Vera Etches, Chief Medical Officer of Health, Médecin Chef en Santé Publique, and Dr. Doug Manuel, Senior Scientist of the Clinical Epidemiology Program at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Clinicien principal pour le programme d'épidémiologie clinique à l'Institut de recherche de l'Hôpital d'Ottawa. Dr. Brent Malachny, Associate Medical Officer of Health, Médecin Chef adjoint de la Santé Publique, is also on the call to respond to questions. Following the remarks, we will then take questions from media. Please go ahead, Dr. Etches. So today is the day we enter stage two of the province's recovery plan, and we achieved this together. I'm extremely proud of the people of Ottawa for getting us here. Uh, but the reality is, of course, that this is not the end. Uh, we must continue cautiously to prevent infections and keep this virus at a manageable level in our community. Testing and follow-up is not sufficient to control the virus. We really must prevent transmission. So that's why I'm asking all of you to continue to be COVID wise. W for wear a mask when you cannot be uh, further than two meters away from, or when you have, have trouble making uh, that two meter distance with others who are outside your household. I for isolate yourself. And if you have symptoms uh, when you're sick and you're isolating to go, go present to be tested for COVID-19, make sure it's not COVID. Uh, S for stay two meters away from those who aren't within your household or, or now we have a new term we can talk about your social circle. Uh, e, exercise proper hand hygiene and that uh, means washing your hands regularly or using hand sanitizer if you're out, especially before you touch your face. So as we enter stage two and we resume some of our activities, being able to assess your own individual situation and the associated risks uh, and, and making informed decision is key. Tandis que nous entamons at l'étape 2 et reprenons certaines de nos activités, nous devrions évaluer notre situation personnelle et les risques qui en découlent. Because what is permissible under the provincial order will continue to change and provincial advice does not address all possible scenarios, some confusion may result. And there are differences between what's recommended and what's legally allowed. So I appreciate that for some people, this can cause a level of anxiety. Ottawa Public Health is here to help residents through uncertainty and um, we're here to answer questions. And we're also emphasizing that the principles to decrease risk do not change. So the province is now allowing group gatherings to increase from five to 10 people and earlier in the day announced guidance on how to establish a social circle with those outside your household. So no matter what, in a gathering, in a, in a social circle, it is wise to limit your contacts uh, as much as possible and keep gatherings uh, to fewer people to decrease the risk and keep, keep those gatherings to the same people over time so that again, your contacts in total are limited. Uh, les rassemblements sociaux passeront de 5 à 10 personnes, mais il demeure sage de réduire nos contacts, de restreindre la taille des groupes et de nous limiter au même groupe de personnes. So try to keep your activities outdoors. Uh, for now, avoid common greetings like handshakes and hugs and assess your own unique situations, your associated risks. For example, whether you are or you live with someone who may be at higher risk for serious complications of COVID-19. Um, we've heard uh, concerns from adults over age 70 years old that they're not sure which activities they should resume. 
So just like everyone else, we need, um, you know, recommend that you assess your own risk uh, as older adults are more vulnerable to serious outcomes uh, with the virus infection and to keep in mind the same principles of how you can reduce the risk of transmission. So we continue to work uh, with our City of Ottawa partners to provide more guidance to businesses as well on how to uh, you know, offer uh, lower risk services. La Ville d'Ottawa poursuivra son travail avec ses partenaires en et en temps de vous tra transmettre plus de conseils sur la façon de reprendre vos activités commerciales en toute sécurité. So we've contributed to the city's business toolkit, provided specific restaurant uh, guidance, businesses that provide personal service settings. Uh, you know, we're gonna be holding a series of workshops over the next several weeks for different businesses like day camps or childcare settings, construction and manufacturing offices and professional services, retail vehicle deal dealerships. Uh, you know, our, our local businesses have sacrificed a lot by staying closed uh, or reducing their services to limit the spread of COVID uh, in our community. So let's honor their efforts uh, by being respectful and patient customers as we go back and, and, and keep in mind the protection of the health of the employees involved. Nos entreprises locales ont fait beaucoup de sacrifices en restant fermées ou en réduisant leurs services pour limiter la propagation de la COVID-19, rendant hommage à leurs efforts en demeure des clients respectueux et patients. Ça, c'est pour la protection des employés. And let's learn to continue to be COVID-wise. So that, uh, those details, again, are on our website, ottawapublichealth.ca backslash COVID-wise. On another subject, uh, yesterday, the province of Ontario announced that visits will be allowed to resume in long-term care homes and retirement homes starting June 18th with certain limitations. Uh, for example, a home must not be an outbreak, uh, must have established visitor protocols in place and maintain uh, the highest infection prevention and control standards. So only outdoor visits will be permitted during this first phase and only one visitor at a time per resident. Uh, according to the Provincial Ministry of Long-Term Care Policy, visitors will also be allowed to, or uh, required, uh, sorry, to pass active screening every time they visit. Uh, and they also need to confirm with staff that they've tested negative for COVID-19 uh, COVID within the previous two weeks. So um, visitors then, in, in principle, the idea is, is consider your personal health, uh, the susceptibility to the virus, uh, and, and determine, um, you know, do that risk assessment before visiting a long-term care home. It is important to note that long-term care homes can decide if they want or they need to continue prohibiting visits. And if so, then they should offer uh, virtual options. Uh, the actions of one visitor that might unknowingly introduce COVID-19 into a home could lead to extremely negative circumstances and uh, utmost care is important. Les visiteurs doivent tenir compte de leur propre santé et de leur vulnérabilité au virus au moment de décider s'il si, si est approprié pour eux de visiter un proche d'un établissement de soins de longue durée. Il est important de noter que les foyers peuvent décider de maintenir l'interdiction des visites. Si tel est le cas, ils devraient continuer d'offrir des visites virtuelles. The role that families, visitors, and loved ones play in providing caregiving and emotional supports is important for the quality of life and the health of residents in long-term care homes, and it must be balanced with mitigating the risk of death for residents. More important uh, information uh, is on the, the Ontario website, ontario.ca, for people who are looking at visiting. So lastly, on our daily COVID-19 dashboard, uh, data plays an important role in, in uh, helping guide our community and, and informing recommendations as we move forward. So earlier this week, we launched our, a new daily dashboard that's more interactive. Uh, it's updated daily as data becomes available directly from our database. Uh, and this, this dynamic tool you know, serves as your ongoing source for information about cases, outbreaks, and those core indicators that we're monitoring to, to assess the situation in our community. The new tool is a snapshot each day of the information that's housed uh, previously in a few places. 
uh, and we do know um, people are interested in the in the the idea of the previous reports still being accessible. They are archived on our website. Uh, the new value tea currently an aperçu de l'ensemble des informations qui étaient auparavant hébergées à plusieurs endroits. Même si vous trouvez toujours des rapports qui ont été archivés avant le 10 juin sur notre site web, uh, vous pourrez à l'avenir utiliser le tableau de bord interactif pour trouver des informations à jour. Uh, my team has produced a user's guide uh, that's available now on the same website to understand how to use the tool if that's uh, required. And we do welcome your feedback as we continue to really prioritize transparency and sharing the information that we have with the public. My focus and the focus of Ottawa Public Health is to continue to provide guidance and information so you can make informed decisions to help keep our city healthy. So with ongoing caution, we can get back to more of the things we enjoy. Stay safe and be COVID wise. Merci and miigwech. Thank you, Dr. Etches. Uh, please go ahead, Dr. Manuel. Uh, hi, everyone. As you know, I um, usually keep my remarks uh, around the topic of, of modeling and projection. It's interesting. I, I didn't, Dr. Etches and I didn't talk uh, before what we're talking about, but today I'm going to talk a bit about long term care facilities and what's been happening there. Uh, so I have four remarks about the progress in the last week from the perspective of modeling, the key drivers for that progress, or a key driver, um, how general comments about transmission in the community, and a few cautionary notes to end with. So in the past week in Canada, uh, we've seen some really good progress, and that magic number R, R that we talked about has dropped quite a bit across Canada to about uh, Public Health Agency of Canada is reporting about 0.6 and 0.6 to 0.8 um, and uh, we've been doing here well in Ottawa too. I haven't um, formally calculated that number but I, I think that you know we're, we're below the um, national average and doing quite well. That would translate into now a halving time of new cases so if there's say 10 new cases um, today then it, five new cases um, it would decrease to five new cases about every in about five to seven days so we're seeing a drop in cases over time. Um, I'd like to focus on one of the key drivers for why we're seeing a drop in Ottawa, and that's the drop that we're seeing in long-term care facilities. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, since the alarm bells rang, since we really realized what was happening in long-term care facilities, we've seen a really dramatic drop in the number of new cases. So over the past week, six weeks, from my count, we've seen one new outbreak in a long-term care facility in Ottawa, and that compares to, I think it's 17 outbreaks in the previous six, uh, previous six weeks. So there's been a tremendous stop in the transmission of spread to long-term care facilities and within long-term care facilities. The number of cases have, have really reduced dramatically. Um, and this has happened despite very high risk of transmission in long-term care facilities. So this is facilities where there's a lot of people in a small space and the people who, um, older people are more likely to tra transmit to other people. So we've had a tremendous risk for spread and despite that, we've seen a dramatic reduction, a faster reduction. The rate has decreased faster in long-term care facilities than we've seen in the general population in Ottawa. So, um, that's, um, I mean, for, for me, I think that I started off feeling extremely discouraged and frustrated by the, the outbreaks. Um, mo one of the most frustrating and discouraging parts of, of COVID so far, but now that's sort of switched into this really sort of uh, encouragement and really impressed by the efforts of everyone that's been working in long-term care facilities for the past six weeks. They've really achieved uh, tremendous uh, progress. Uh, and that progress has resulted in hundreds of lives saved. So uh, COVID would not stop in the long-term care facilities from burning itself out and gaining herd immunity. It stopped because of the control measures and the effectiveness of the control measures in the long-term care facility. Currently in Ottawa, we have about 8% of residents that have um, developed COVID uh, since the beginning of, of uh, the pandemic. So um, 
8%, that means there's a lot of people left. And, uh, and it didn't stop uh, because we ran out of susceptible people. It stopped because the transmission, because of successful control. So, um, so really, hundreds of lives have been saved in the last six weeks uh, from the efforts of all those people that have been working there and, and people that new people that uh, helped with that. Um, I'd also like to point out the connection between long-term care facilities and the community, and this builds on uh, what Dr. Etches was talking about as well. So. Uh, the infections began in long-term care facilities because of spread from the community to long-term care facilities. Uh, that's the only way they can get in. It doesn't sort of appear uh, from no, from air, you know, um, and that uh, and so that the actions reduce that and reduce it very quickly. Because of those, uh, the other part about reducing the, the spread in long-term care facilities, it uh, it helped reduce the spread in the community as well. So all those efforts in long-term care facility had the additional benefit of helping spread in the community. Um, so it's kind of a double thanks for the effort that people had in long-term care facility. Uh, but now we have sort of this opposite pos position too, where we, we now have this increasing possibility of spread back into the long-term care facilities as we sort of open up, reopen, and have have more people connecting. So there's that that's that um, that possibility is still extremely real. A lot of older people in crowded in in, in a a close location who are at high risk of uh, complications or death and high risk of transmitting to others. So as we open up, we're basically back to where we were again before, where the potential to spread and have outbreaks in long-term care facilities is very, very high. Um, so uh, so I think that is when you're wearing masks and you're being wise, we're, we're keeping that transmission as low as possible in the community and when it's low as possible in the community, the likelihood of it going into long-term care facilities and affecting our vulnerable populations is reduced. So again, we're doing everything, not only for ourselves, but for our most vulnerable populations. And successful open reopening will mean that we're all uh, contributing to this lower likelihood of transmission into the community, through the community, and then through the community into the long-term care facilities. So it's that tricky balance between uh, protecting our long our residents long-term care facilities and increase we know the health benefits or um, of increased social interactions so I think everyone's very keen to increase that uh, but we just need to do that in a very safe way um, that is all my comments thank you dr. Manuel in the interest of time I will quickly read through the list of media who have registered no need to indicate if you are present. However, if I missed your outlet, please speak up after I am through the list. Pour gagner du temps, je vais lire la liste des médias qui se sont inscrits. Vous n'avez pas besoin d'indiquer si vous êtes présent, sauf si je n'ai pas nommé votre organisation. Um, alors, on commencera avec 104.7, Outaouette, 1310 News, CBC Ottawa, CTV News Ottawa, Global News, Le Droit, On the City from the Birds, Orlean Star, Radio Canada, and Rogers TV. Have I missed anyone? Great, I will now invite each agency in alphabetical order to ask their question. Please remember you have one question and one follow-up. Nous allons maintenant répondre aux questions des médias en ordre alphabétique. Chacun pourra poser une question et une question de suivi. Alors, um, on commence avec Olivier Beauregard avec 104.7 Outaouais. Olivier? Um, we will go to 1310 News. Jason White, go ahead, please, Jason. Hi there. Um, so my question is uh, around uh, things reopening. And as we see the um, potential for increase in transmission and, and more cases as we start to open more things and interact more, I'm wondering if, if someone can quantify how much co more COVID-19 activity would we see before you would begin to become concerned about the spread? I understand we have a, we have a finite capacity in, in our healthcare system. Um, so I, I'm wondering if there's some sort of idea of um, if you could quantify where we are now versus where we would have to get to the point where you'd start to be concerned that there's too much spread or too much COVID-19 activity in Ottawa.
I can see Doug looking at me, and I, I really welcome your answer too, Doug. That that uh, what what I'll say to begin with is that uh, we are looking at a whole bunch of measures altogether. Um, you know, the, the core indicators are on our website. So we're looking at numbers of cases, we're looking at hospitalizations, we're looking at hospital capacity, we're looking at how public health can manage the follow-up, how the testing uh, is going, you know, the percent positive, there's a lot of variables. So no one measure is going to, uh, you know, um, ca cause concern or, or, or lead to recommendations that we need to do something differently. Um, However, like before, I think I've said almost all along, one of the most solid measures we have is the hospitalization rate uh, when we're not able to um, necessarily detect every last case in the population through uh, testing or, you know, even though it's open and we recommend anyone uh, who has symptoms, please present for testing. Uh, we know that the, the proportion hospitalized represents a proportion uh, that is pretty stable probably and, and um, and tells us what's going on. So I do do watch that one carefully. Um, it, it is the capacity of our hospitals that uh, people were most concerned about uh, not overwhelming because we've seen that around the world. And uh, we know that the hospitals have been able to expand their capacity. They've, they've taken this time to prepare. Um, so so our threshold of, of concern is, is probably a little bit higher than it was earlier because, because there's a bit more hospital capacity. That said, and it's probably what Doug can speak to, things can ac accelerate very quickly. Uh, so the, the doubling time of cases uh, back in, in March was every three to four days. And so, you know, I think about this from a public health management point of view of our team that's trying to follow up with cases. Imagine, do we have to double our team every three to four days? And, and we, that's our goal. Like our goal is to continue the follow-up of all of these cases as, as much as we can and grow our team. But there's a limit when it comes to doubling hospital beds every three to four days, right, if that's needed. So um, we will be looking for those early signs, communicating, uh, sharing information with the public. It's, it's not complicated what we have to do. It's, it's the same thing that we've been doing successfully, which is maintaining distance between each other. Uh, and so uh, we'll just continue to, uh, to encourage people to keep that in mind. And Doug, if you want to add, please go ahead. Um, I, well, I agree. When I look at places around the world and try to make a judgment whether they're going to run into problems or not, and there are places, there are uh, southern states, many southern states are, are, there's definitely areas for concern, and you're looking at those dashboards, uh, the same metrics that Ottawa Public Health has set up here, so not one. Uh, but I just to, maybe just a few additional comments. One is that um, uh, it's kind of like steering a, a you know a big truck or a big boat. It, you can't change the control measures very quickly. So what public health uh, does, um, what Ottawa Public Health is doing, and the effect on the hospitals takes a, takes a few weeks. So uh, f what that means to me, and I think I, I can speak on behalf of the hospital as well, is that we're looking ahead three, four, five weeks. And um, and so you don't have to see a, a lot of change before three, four, or five weeks. You're running, you're, you're starting to see projections in healthcare use that are are running into difficulties. So uh, that's why it it's a phased approach coming in. And if we, even if we saw a deflection of that and the projections are looking upward, then I, I think there's the serious discussions about having to uh, having to tighten up the control measures again. And it's just because we can't change the course really quickly. There's a lag time in that. So that'd be the only other thing, this exponential growth and that sort of delay. Um, and so for me personally, I don't speak on behalf of Ottawa Public Health, but I look for these early warnings, uh, these early signs that things are, are changing and we project out from that. The projections that we run in the hospital and what we run for, um, for the, th the community, um, like the hospital, uh, S says to me, if I can provide accurate estimates, we can have accurate estimates three, four, five weeks out, then that gives them a level of, of comfort as well that if we need to, we can we can get new capacity on, on board. And that three, four, five weeks, I think that we have good eyes on that, then we can feed back to everyone um, and the community and, uh, uh, and, and address the control as needed. So any inflection upwards, but definitely looking at those projections for all the metrics and seeing what they look like three, four, five weeks ahead of time. 
Thank you, both of you. Um, that was helpful. Um, my follow-up question, I'm just wondering about uh, the, the Ottawa Public Health's help for business and the guidance in, in how to reopen safely. Uh, how has that been going? Has there been a lot of uptake from, from businesses? Um, do you have any sort of sense of, of uh, how much demand there's been for, for that help? Sorry, Brent, I think you're on mute still. Try again. Uh, okay. Gotcha. Okay, sorry about that. So let me start over again. So it's Brent Mulhoney. Um, so I would say that uh, with uh, the announcement of the uh, of the stage two, uh, we've had a, a very, very uh, large uh, amount of inquiries coming from a large number of uh, of organizations. And, and Dr. Etch has already mentioned that we've got a number of uh, webinars planned with various business sectors starting next week and, and, and occurring over subsequent weeks. Um, we've been putting out um, as quickly as we can uh, more specific guidance to complement what the province has provided. Uh, we've done that initially for personal service settings. Uh, we've uh, done it for um, for, for the restaurant patios. We're working on places of workshop right, right now and, uh, and day camps and a number of others. So it's a, certainly a very, very busy area of activity, but I, I think it's a very important role for us in Ottawa Public Health to be able to provide recommendations and advice because businesses wanna open in a manner that uh, is as safe as possible for their employees and for, and for their clients. And so this is a mutual goal. And uh, so we're very happy to be able to be supporting business in this way. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Jason. Um, up next, we have Joanne Kinelo, CBC Ottawa. Please go ahead, Joanne. Hi there. Am I unmuted? You're good. Good. All right. Um, uh, so we're getting all kinds of reports back today. Of course, people are very excited to be out in stage two here today, but uh, some, some patios, people seem to be social distancing, but we just got a call in that like, lands down park, uh, the patios are packed and it doesn't look like people are social distancing. So I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about the early reviews, what you're hearing, what you're seeing, how this is all gonna work out. Cause as I, I think Dr. Etch just said, uh, I think there's lots of people wondering, you know, exactly what to do and what's okay. Uh, okay, I don't have uh, too, too much of a formal report back yet, so you're probably uh, out there a bit more and seeing and reporting on things uh, in real time. Um, what I have is the polling data that told us that, uh, you know, 95%, 94%, I think, of people are continuing to maintain physical distancing uh, most of the time, or almost, most, uh, almost all of the time, or always, and, um, you know, that speaks to the sentiment that people understand the physical distancing is important, uh, that they're trying to do it. Um, the, the, the hard thing, is it's, it's hard to judge when you see people out, right? Are, are they part, part of this social circle uh, of, of people who are, are forming a, a social circle of up to 10 now? The, 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 the advice of our Chief Medical Officer of Health is that um, enables that closer contact to expand from just your household, um, or, or is it a gathering of people that it's one of those non-social circle gatherings of 10 people where we do recommend people try uh, to continue to maintain that physical distancing. You know, it, it's hard, it, it's, it we need to be, uh, you know, compassionate and, and, and just try each of us to do our part to maintain physical distancing and clarify uh, if we're not seeing it happening, you know, there's you know, polite ways to say, uh, can I have a little more space here? Like there's, there's things we're gonna have to learn how to, to, uh, to, to, to work on this together. Uh, we are gonna monitor, uh, so we'll repeat our polling weekly uh, to see what is happening from a representative sample across uh, and, and getting feedback. We'll be getting feedback from others, uh, from businesses. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, Joanne, if you have, if you have a other thought. Yeah, sure, I mean, I mean it's, it's confusing, right? Because of course, it, we just heard this afternoon that uh, from from the province that you know you can hug in your group of ten, but does that mean you can only see ten people, or can you still see people if you're staying two meters away? You know, can you see more than that many people? So obviously, right. they're trying let to me, work out the rules. Yeah. Let me go back uh, beyond the rules, uh, back to the basics, which is uh, 
to decrease transmission in our community, it's best to limit the number of contacts you have, whether they're close or they're in a gathering that's a bit, you know, beyond your social circle. The fewer people, the better. That's that's the principle, uh, and and the same people over time uh, makes sense because then that keeps the number of contacts down as well. Um, that 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 just it, it means the opportunity for transmission from one group to another group, and over time, you know, isn't there. Uh, you can stop the transmission between groups, and um, makes it easier if we do find a case to do that follow up to identify who who were all the contacts. Uh, you know, we go back uh, uh, and, and try to look at everyone's uh, activities during their, their incubation period, the period where they're infectious there. And, and, and um, you know, it can be hard for people to remember who are all my contacts during that time it's, if, if there's a large number of people. Uh, so keeping the number smaller uh, also facilitates that follow up. Anyone else wants to add? Pretty easily. That's one of the challenges that we have for COVID, that we do have this pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic spread, and it can happen pretty quickly. So it's it, it's COVID's exponential. It's everything's exponential. The number of contacts increase exponentially, and the spread increases exponentially. So just kind of building on what Dr. Richards was saying. That's great. Can I have a follow up? Go for it. Okay. Uh, we're just talking also with the farmer's market. So there's the Ottawa farmer's market at Lansdowne where it seems like people have to pre-order and line up, but now the Byward market and Parkdale markets are opening where you don't have to do that. It's just, um, there are some rules where you have to sort of, uh, I think line up and go in one direction, that sort of thing. And we're hearing from vendors saying, why are there two different rules for that? Can you tell us from an Ottawa public health perspective, like? Is there a reason that the the procedures have to be different at those two markets? So thanks, uh, thanks, Joanne. I'll, I'll take this. This is Brent Mulhney. Um So I think we're in a, a bit of a transition. As you know, um, when the, the farmer's market started up, it was as you described where you'd be online, you ordered ahead of time, and there was kind of a curbside pickup. Um, we're now in a bit of a transition period where uh, with guidance from the province and a, and a provincial farmers markets association has provided guidance as to how to sort of open up uh, farmer markets more. Um, and so uh, we are receiving plans here at OPH from farmer markets and uh, their landlords uh, in terms of what they uh, would like to do and are we are providing public health guidance back. Uh, so I think it's it, right now it's as I said we're in a bit of a transition and it's also dependent upon who the, the landlord is and who the market is. Uh, but certainly we are seeing applications or, or at least plans that we're providing advice on uh, to, to be able to, um, as you say, visit the market itself and uh, uh, maintain distancing, but be able to purchase uh, on site. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, thank Joanne. You. Um, up next, we have CTV, Josh Pringle. Please go ahead, Josh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Etches, I know you said you want people to go back to basics, even though we're starting to expand the uh, COVID, uh, what you can do, go to malls, interactions and stuff. Do you have any advice for people when they're looking at how to expand their social bubbles in terms of what they should consider before welcoming people into their bubble and expanding it beyond the people inside their household? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, I'll, um, I think what we've heard from the population is that uh, not being able to have social contacts outside of the household um, has been difficult, uh, especially if the household is small, uh, if people are um, single parent or they're, they're an isolated uh, older adult. And so it's about what, what expansion of your social circle would, would best meet your needs. Um, you know, is it that you need to have um, access to a certain kind of um, so social support or childcare or, you know, and then um, the advice is to, to have a conversation uh, with the people that you think uh, would be most supportive uh, in your social circle about their ability to maintain that social circle and not, not go off and join in another social circle so that, that you can have assurance and confidence that you're, you're together uh, keeping that number of contacts down. 
Uh, you also want to think about uh, the, the health risks uh, to, to people who uh, are older, um, or who have underlying medical conditions, uh, whether that exists in your household, uh, and, and if you're introducing new people who, who might bring in a risk, or if, if the people you're thinking about bringing in might be more vulnerable, then um, you know, that may be an additional consideration to, to think about uh, being extra cautious about increasing the number of, of contacts. Um, and then the idea is that, that that social circle would stay consistent. Um, uh, but I think the, the advice actually also is to, again, you can have closer contact in that social circle, which will be, you know, hugs are important for health. Uh, that'll be great. Uh, but don't forget to wash your hands. You know, there's still things you, that we all do that, that can uh, still make a difference, even, even in those circumstances. My follow-up question, any concerns that there may be some confusion about what you can and cannot do as the rules have started to be relaxed a little bit and what people can do, have people over, in people into your house, have people stay still a distance away? I, I, I do acknowledge uh, absolutely that there are a lot of questions uh, about what's allowed, what's not allowed. Uh, it's why I think you know, that it's important to just as a bottom line, remember the fewer contacts, the better. And if we're gonna expand, it's expanding those close contacts that is most hazardous or potentially hazardous, right? The, the, the close contacts, like in a, in a kind of a family setting or a close friendship where you're, you're touching and hugging, that's the kind of highest risk activity. And so if you want to expand in a, in a safer way, it's about keeping the physical distancing. So, so visiting others, but staying two meters away. Uh, that's that's a really uh, great way to expand uh, social connections, uh, but keep keep them um, lower risk. Uh, so I, I I would say those those are the basic principles. And then sure, the number ten is there. You can keep that in mind. And when it comes to ten, either in your social circle or a gathering, again, the same people is the safest way to go. Great, thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Josh. Um, up next, we have Craig Lord with Global News. Please go ahead, Craig. Thank you. Um, can we talk a little bit about the difference in risk between indoor versus outdoor socialization? Uh, restaurants are allowed to have outdoor seating right now, but not indoor. Um, just wondering, what are the risk differences there? How big of a difference is it if I'm hanging out inside a friend's house or if we're meeting on the beach where it might be windy and those droplets are flying? Uh, can you get a little bit of a discussion on that? I'll do my best uh, to answer where there's basically not very much evidence and I'll invite my colleagues who might have read something recently uh, with more evidence to join in. Uh, we're learning about how this virus is transmitted. We're learning, we're trying to evaluate uh, exposure risks in different settings. So we haven't seen a lot of transmission that can definitively be linked to uh, activities in an outdoor setting. Uh, and we hypothesize based on what we know about viruses and uh, that there's reasons for that, uh, that uh, more air circulation disperses uh, the, the virus, uh, concentrations lower, so you're not exposed to as much. There may be a role for sunlight, um, you know, in, in decreasing the viability of the viruses. Um, so the wind is interesting because it helps you disperse uh, and, and decrease the concentration that you might be exposed to. But if it's, uh, I think it's, it's the, the directed air, if you know, if you're, if you're, you know, uh, getting a direct stream of, of air from somebody who's infected and, and sending the droplets your way, of course, that's going to be worse. Uh, but we don't seem to see that as much in outdoor settings. Uh, so that, that can't be quantified, but it is behind the recommendations that we have uh, about um, pursuing outdoor activities uh, versus indoor. Great, uh, appreciate you uh, doing the best. I know that these are all new questions that you're trying to answer every day and with uh, very little evidence sometimes to be able to give a fulsome answer. Um, I have another maybe tricky question for you, I'm sorry. Um, are there any specific threats when it comes to food preparation? Uh, I'm thinking maybe if people this weekend are having potlucks, uh, is there a risk to me if someone else is preparing my meal? 
Thank you. Uh, no, the questions are good. It's, it's worth asking and we're going to continue to share the best information we have. Uh, these are frequently asked questions that we can uh, continue to add to our website and encourage people to go, um, you know, as information evolves, we have a quality assurance uh, process now to make sure we're all always looking at making sure the latest information is up. So uh, what I know at this point are, are around food, is that there isn't much evidence uh, of transmission of the virus with food, um, but but the sharing of things uh, does increase, you know, the like, you know, the potential uh, for transmission of the virus. So uh, the idea of uh, bringing bringing a dish uh, to a picnic and sharing that dish, you know, that that could increase the risk of exposure to virus if somebody was infected who prepared it or touched the utensils. So a picnic where people bring their own food uh, and stay the two meters apart is, is you know, that's, that's recommended. Uh, and um, yes, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's tough, right? Because uh, sharing food, again, is, is something very social, is something that, uh, you know, it helps us feel connected. Um, these are measures for right now. Uh, this is a time when we need to remember we need to take extra caution uh, and, and we'll continue to learn and, and proceed carefully and, and provide uh, new advice as the situation changes. Great, thanks so much. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Maintenant, nous dirons à Julien Paquet avec le doigt. À vous. Merci. Euh, oui, Dr. Etches, euh, j'aimerais vous entendre euh, sur le, le nombre de tests qui sont réalisés euh, quotidiennement depuis, depuis quelques semaines. Je sais que quand on a euh, élargi les critères d'admissibilité aux tests, vous, vous incitiez beaucoup euh, à ce que les gens euh, se, se prévalent de ce, de ce droit-là de, de, de se faire tester. Donc, depuis ce moment-là, euh, comment ça se passe? Uh, oui, c'est um, vrai que le nombre de dépistages pour COVID-19 augmente uh, et le niveau uh, maintenant est un peu stable à un niveau plus haut. Alors, uh, à la centre de dépistage uh, et évaluation, uh, le nombre est uh, presque deux fois auparavant et um, les laboratoires sont occupés. Uh, J'ai visité un des de laboratoires hier et c'est incroyable uh, la, la différence uh, qu'ils ont fait uh, et le, le grand effort de, de, de processus uh, en place pour avoir, av excusez, les processus en place d'avoir un temps court pour uh, avoir les résultats. C'est Uh, encore possible d'avoir les résultats pendant les 24 heures, uh, par exemple, uh, qu'on veut. On veut. Um, uh, oui, uh, alors la capacité de notre laboratoire ici uh, dans la région pour plus que Ottawa, c'est presque 2000. Et aussi uh, les laboratoires à d'autres machines et d'autres plans pour uh, augmenter ce nombre encore. Alors, um, on va continuer d'utiliser la capacité que nous avons et aussi, um, c'est Dr. Malachny qui est le leader pour santé publique concernant notre stratégie pour les dépistages. Uh, c'est um, notre partenaire dans les hôpitaux uh, qui a uh, le leadership pour déterminer uh, comment on peut um, changer le point d'accès dans notre communauté et uh, pour santé publique, c'est de continuer d'utiliser notre information de, pour déterminer où il y a peut-être un environnement plus à risque, uh, un type de travail, uh, un um, quartier par exemple, uh, où il y a une éclosion, c'est santé publique qui peut informer le système et uh, utiliser uh, les différents services pour uh, avoir une Uh, uh, accès plus cible aux, uh, aux populations à risque. Mais pour le moment, oui, c'est occupé, mais les laboratoires ont la capacité et on continue avec un niveau plus haut. Parfait, merci. Euh, et puis, l'autre question que j'aurais pour vous, euh, bon, le docteur Manuel euh, a souligné qu'on était un peu un, un retour à la case départ pour ce qui est de, du risque d'infection dans les euh, 
dans les, dans les euh, foyers de soins de longue durée, euh, à quel point le, le fait qu'aujourd'hui, que, qu on, euh, on en sait plus sur, le, sur ce virus, euh, ça, peut, ça peut jouer en notre faveur pour éviter qu on, qu on, que le, 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 le nombre d'éclosions reprenne comme ça a été le cas euh, il, y a, il y a plusieurs semaines. Oui. Euh, Est-ce que vous pouvez répéter juste la question, s'il vous plaît? Euh, euh, oui, je, je peux. En fait, la question, c'est est-ce que toutes les connaissances qu'on a acquises sur la COVID-19 depuis, euh, depuis le début de la pandémie, de quel, à quel point ça, ça, ça nous aide pour limiter le nombre d'éclosions euh, maintenant qu'on ouvre à nouveau les, 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 les foyers de soins de longue durée à des visites? Jusqu'à quel point ça va nous aider à, à éviter un nombre d'éclosions comme on a vu euh, il, y a, il y a plusieurs semaines, il y a quelques mois? Euh, je pense que je comprends la question. Le point le plus important, c'est d'éviter que le virus ait introduit dans les foyers de soins de longue durée. Alors, c'est une question de euh, surveillance. Euh, aux employés euh, de reconnaître maintenant, euh, on, on reconnaît que les symptômes de COVID-19 peuvent être vraiment faibles. Alors, c'est peut-être avec euh, une euh, mal à la tête, une fatigue, on, on peut penser à COVID-19 et faire attention aux symptômes qui ne sont pas, qui pas, qui ne sont pas sévères et euh, euh, la vie de ne travaille pas quand ils sont malades, c'est vraiment important euh, dans cette euh, situation. Euh, aussi, il y a des pratiques euh, dans les foyers de soins de longue durée maintenant qui euh, est vraiment fort quand, euh, concernant l'utilisation des euh, masques, des, des gants, euh, le, le processus pour... Euh, euh, la, la protection des résidents, euh, euh, c'est maintenant, c'est tout le temps que les employés portent les masques, par exemple. Euh, ce n'était pas comme ça auparavant. Et euh, ces mesures comme ça peuvent aider euh, de réduire la transmission dans euh, les maisons. Mais c'est délicat, c'est vraiment délicat. Et euh, comme Dr. Emmanuel a dit, euh, le nombre de cas dans la communauté ça, c'est le risque pour les, les foyers de soins de longue durée. Si le, le, le nombre de, de cas augmente dans la communauté, c'est où les employés peuvent être exposés. Ce n'est pas juste si les pratiques dans la maison sont importantes, c'est que nous sommes tous ensemble une communauté euh, vraiment connectée. Est-ce que ça, ça répond à votre question? Oui, merci beaucoup. Parfait, merci Julien. Up next, we have Susan Charing from On the City from the Burbs. Please go ahead, Susan. Sorry, Susan, you might be on mute. Sorry, am I on now? Yeah, we can hear you. Please go Sorry ahead. about that. Um, I feel, Dr. Etches, that the... Um, Certainly for me, someone who lives alone, the news that we can actually like hug people now is is going to uh, make a lot of people happy. And I, when I'm going to explain it on my blog, I just want to make sure I get it all right. So when you talk about a group of 10, does that mean that anyone I'm in contact with has to have the same group of 10? That's the idea, yes. So you're creating a social circle uh, is the terminology the province is using that is just that circle for those people. And anyone that's in that group, that is the group they've chosen and they're not joining another group of 10. And that's a conversation to have with everyone um, to make sure uh, because if one person joins another group of 10, then that's really like it's a group of 20. Uh, and then if somebody else joins another group, that's like a group of 30. And then you start to get a lot of challenge, uh, you know, and more exposures and potential for transmission. So it is about trying to 
identify that TEM that becomes that social circle for now. Uh, again, I, I hope we can continue to progress uh, and this is, this is a cautious step now. Um, I'm hoping to be able to turn this into a two-part question because I don't want to put out the wrong information, but if it's okay to, to be in contact with 10, I don't really understand why it's not, like why, why 10? Like where does that number come from? My advice to everyone is keep it as small as possible. Uh, I think 10 because of the confusion around gatherings of 10 and, and, and you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's hard. You have to pick a number, right? And, and so, you know, there's different size families. If you're a single person, you know, two extra people in your social support circle might be sufficient for now to, to really feel that sense of relief and, and my goodness connection. But if you're a family of eight and you have, uh, you know, an aunt and an uncle that you want to include, well, 10 is just, just barely enough to, to have another, you know, set of hands to help with the kids. So it's really going to depend on your particular uh, situation. I think in, individual will have to assess what they need. My advice as your medical officer of health is the smaller, the better still, as we're early days, we're opening up a lot of activities. There's a lot of new opportunities for transmission of the virus. The more we keep our contacts uh, limited, uh, the less that will happen. And, uh, and we'll, we'll go on from here. Well, I do sense my two adult sons aren't quite as happy about the news as I am. But, uh, and so just um, my follow-up, and I'm not sure how comfortable you're going to be answering this, but it seems in the last few days, a lot of opportunities have opened in terms of social contact. Um, in terms of the physical, allowing us to actually touch, hug, kiss 10 people, are you comfortable with that decision? What I, what I think is important with a change around the concept of the household to now the social circle is that people can access supports that they have been missing, right? So people have absolutely had negative impacts on their health because they've done their best and they've tried really hard to just stick to their household. And thank you again to everyone who's really gone through this period that's been difficult. And so I think that's good to be able to get some more support. We've heard, we've, the people of Ottawa have told us this has been hard on their mental health. We need extra support. Just be careful as you go forward and expand and get that social support that you're talking to people about who their contacts are and, 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 and using this concept, if you're gonna have close contact, like the hugging, that that, that number is defined, that it's not an open-ended circle and, you know, I don't know, I'm going to start talking about semicircles. I don't know. <laughs> you know, like it really is, um, I think, then useful to come back to this, this separate idea of the gathering. And if you need to connect with other friends who aren't going to be your close huggers, uh, that keep the two meters, right? So, so you're going to be in touch with others, visit them with the physical distancing. And, and that's, a, that's a safer alternative. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Dr. Sarah. Oh, go ahead. Yes. I don't know if I'll add a couple of comments. I'm not sure, sure. if it's going to be helpful. Yes, but, thank you. You know, I, I think this this is a challenging, every stage of COVID is going to be, have different challenges. Um, and I think for all of everyone on this YouTube, there's a lot of media that have our, our, our communicators. Um, at the first stage, you know, flattening, you know, it's very simple message, you know, don't do anything pretty much. And, um, and but now we're in this really tricky stage where the messaging is, is is a little bit less clear uh, like we're not we're, we don't have a really high level of circulating covid we don't have zero so i think the term is being smart and being wise and and we don't have a lot of physical distancing credit in the bank we've got maybe 10 percent. you know we can't spend the more we do the more we're in contact the more the, the more likely the transmission is going to have and we don't have much so I think it's difficult to communicate um, because it's a risk-based thing. There's a lot of value, social value that we want to bring into the into the recommendations, uh, and people are at, at different levels of risk. So I think it's a it's a it's a challenging stage to communicate clearly um, how to you know maximize that 
little bit of credit that we've earned um, and that um, that we think that we can we can do more more activity but still if we do it why you know if the wiser we are the more activity we're going to be able to do if you're in contact with people and you're not being in close contact and transmitting then I think public health is going to be able to move this further and further and it's really a kind of tricky stage to communicate in my mind compared to where we were and maybe where we're going to be three months from now I appreciate that thank you so much doctor um, it looks like um, the Orlean Star is no longer on the call with us, but this is confirmed, Fred. All right. Um, alors, maintenant, nous irons à Jérôme Bergeron avec Radio-Canada. Jérôme, à vous. Oui, bonjour. Euh, petite question. Euh, J'aimerais vous entendre un peu. Julien, vous, a parlé, vous en a parlé, là, mais sur les foyers de longue durée, euh, les éclosions. J'aimerais euh, savoir si j'ai bien compris en français. Euh, si j'ai bien compris, les éclosions dans ces foyers-là ont été résorbées beaucoup plus rapidement que dans euh, la communauté. Êtes-vous en mesure de me dire en ce moment, il y a combien de cas actifs euh, dans les euh, foyers? I don't have that number for you. Uh, we can look into that. Um, that uh... Yeah, that, that requires us to look at when the cases started and if, if they're 14 days after the onset of symptoms, then we consider that case uh, resolved. Um, so it, it's, uh, it, it is a majority of case, cases now. We're, we're past uh, the, the, the 14 days. Um, and so the majority of cases are resolved, but I, I just don't have the exact number for you. Okay. En français, est-ce que je peux avoir le commentaire? Oh, je de... oh, je non, c'est correct. Pensé... Non, mais je n'ai pas que... besoin de l'avoir en français, ce, ce, ce bout-là, là, mais euh, ce que je voudrais savoir en français plus, c'est euh, pourquoi euh, est-ce que ça s'est résorbé rapidement euh, dans les foyers de longue durée, contrairement à la communauté? Et un peu refaire le même commentaire de M. Manuel là, euh, en français, que vous êtes fier, etc. Oui, euh, je, je pense que euh, je peux répondre un peu en français. Et euh, Doc, euh, Dr. Manuel, j'imagine que euh, vous pouvez comprendre la réponse et déterminer si c'est correct. Euh, non? Non? C est, c est Sorry, que... I wasn't listening and, and oh, I should have been paying attention. Yeah. C'est l'idée que la le, le, le diminution dans les cas, dans les foyers de soins de longue durée, est plus rapide que dans la communauté. Et, et c'est parce que ils ont travaillé fort, euh, vraiment, euh, avec euh, plus de mesures pour le contrôle des maladies infectieuses. On porte les masques, par exemple, tout le temps. Et, mais dans la communauté, ça c'est un défi encore. Je voudrais que les gens portent les masques tout le temps quand euh, ils ne peuvent pas faire la distanciation physique. Mais c'est pas là 100% maintenant. Uh, alors, ça, c'est la différence. Les, les mesures de contrôle uh, dans, dans les foyers de soins de longue durée est, est plus fort et ça, ça arrête la transmission. I'm going to need some help. I don't know if I got yeah. all of that. But... I think why the, uh, the, the faster decrease in cases among uh, uh, long-term care homes. Long-term care, yeah. We start off very high. You know, I, I don't know everything. I think I give credit to the, the staff. Um, in being able to follow what we all should be doing. You know, so wearing masks, uh, like, like public health, uh, public health, like uh, uh, Ottawa Public Health has been very experienced in working with uh, facilities for outbreaks for, for decades, it's bread and butter. Um, and there's a lot of procedures that, that public health will put in place uh, once there's an outbreak. Um, and, um, that can slow transmission, things like cohorting, making sure that staff only work with a very limited number of people, um, and then the very vigorous uh, control measures. Um, you know, I think, um, uh, but I, I give staff a lot of credit for that. I don't know beyond that. Um, you know, I think that we had um, in Ottawa, we had as well trained hospital staff um, helping uh, who, are very experienced with infection control measures and how to, I'm, I'm terrible at doffing and wearing, you know, you see me, I'm touching my face. I'm terrible um, at, at myself. Uh, and I have to be very careful when I'm in the operating room uh, about how to, how to don and doff. Uh, but there's a lot of people I, uh, who are much better than that at, than me. And I th think some of that was, um, 
I don't know. You know, I think some of that was we had some some people people that were going in were very experienced as well, and so there's very good support. Uh, and whatever it was, I just give a lot of credit for um, a, a really um, remarkable ability to slam brakes on the outbreaks that were circulating. It was a very difficult situation. I don't know if that helps explaining. Um, oui, c'est yeah. parfait. Euh, si je peux euh, reposer une deuxième question maintenant en français à Mme Etchens. Euh, on, on, on rouvre aujourd'hui plusieurs euh, commerces. Euh, Est-ce que vous êtes un peu inquiet de voir euh, que les gens commencent à sortir, etc.? Est-ce qu'il y a quand même de... Est-ce qu'on a peur que, que les gens relâchent un peu la, la, leurs bonnes habitudes? Comment vous voyez ça? Pour moi, c'est important que les gens ont emploi. C'est vraiment important pour la santé de la population. Euh, C'est vraiment important pour les entreprises d'avoir l'opportunité de continuer et euh, ne perdre pas euh, leur existence. Euh, C'est important. L'économie est importante pour la santé de la population. Et je, je suis euh, vraiment fière euh, que la population d'Ottawa a fait leur part. Uh, depuis le, le début de notre avis de faire la distanciation physique. Et oui, ça, ça devient plus difficile avec temps, c'est vrai, il y a fatigue, mais je pense que la population peut comprendre que c'est important encore et fait, fait ses mesures. Uh, le sondage uh, au début de juin a dit que c'est l'intention de la population de continuer avec la distanciation physique et de porter un masque uh, à l'intérieur quand c'est trop difficile d'être séparé. Alors, ces mesures sont importantes et uh, je pense qu'on trouve un équilibre, équilibre Uh, ça, c'est l'idée de, de trouver une méthode, de recommencer les activités dans une différente méthode, une méthode plus sécuritaire où on peut uh, gérer le nombre de cas qui, qui uh, uh, devient uh, uh, parce que nous avons plus de, des opportunités pour transmission. J'imagine on va voir un plus grand nombre de cas, mais un niveau où on peut gérer Uh, cet nombre de cas, c'est uh, l'idée pour l'avenir. Parfait. Merci, Jérôme. Thank you, Dr. Asher. Um, that's all the time we have for today. C'est tout le temps dont nous disposons aujourd'hui. Thank you and have a good weekend. Merci et bonne fin de semaine. Au revoir. Merci.